Good morning and welcome to our morning service and uh, pray that God will just bless our time together online and in your homes this morning, wherever you are, just pray that God will meet your every needs. I've been reflecting on this lovely hymn based on Psalm 145 where the psalmist says, All your work shall praise thee, O Lord. And as we look around our world today, we see the awesomeness of God's creation. We've experienced the cold of the winter and we've seen the glories of the sunshine. And it's sometimes so easy to forget how great and good God has been to us in so many different ways. And to just reflect on a few of these words, give to our God immortal praise. Mercy and truth are all his ways. Wonders of grace to God belong. Repeat his mercies in your son. song. He built the earth. He spread the skies. He fixed the starry lights on high. Wonders of grace to God belong. Repeat his mercies in your song. He fills the sun. He fills the sun with morning light. He bids the moon direct the night. His mercies ever shall endure when suns and moons shine no more. He sent his son with power to save from guilt and darkness and the grave. Wonders of grace to you belong. Repeat his mercies in your song. And I think it's amazing that, that we can see these things and take these things on board and yet at the same time just miss out on God. And so as we begin our service this morning, let's bow in reflection and prayer and come into the presence of this awesome God. Our God and Father, we are just worshipping you this morning, the God who built the starry skies, the God who controls the sun, the moon and the stars. And every event of our world today is completely within your control. Lord, we worship you of your wonders in creation. And it's truly, Lord, we have watched that silver moon last weekend and just wonder at the magnificence of this moon. Lord, we also worship you today because not only are you the God of creation, but the God of salvation. He sent his son to save us from sins. Lord, you gave your life for us, that ransom for many. And this morning, who like thee, his praise should sing. Lord, we come before you and worship you in praise and prayer. We bless you for the past and we trust you for the future. Lord, this morning, as we come into your word, as we meet around your word, we pray you'll just speak with power, authority and love into our hearts. Maybe, Lord, we're feeling quite close to you today and we just rejoice in the God of our salvation. But there may be some this morning logging in who are far feeling distant and a bit depressed and perhaps a bit low because of things are not as they should be and there's anxieties, concerns and worries. And we just think of those lovely words of Peter where he says, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. There may be those, Lord, who have logged in and not a lot of interest, but Lord, may you... May they just sort of hang on in there this morning and find out for themselves that this God, the God of the universe, the God and Father, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, loves them and gave his Son to save them from their sins and to give them a hope and a future. And so we pray your blessing now upon our service in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from the Old Testament. We're going right back to Genesis chapter 6 and we're going to read... Uh, a few verses from there and dive into the story of Noah a little bit to start with this morning. Genesis 6 verses 3 uh, to 8. And God said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh and his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they bore children of them. These men were mighty, who were old, men of renown. But then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was so great in the earth, and that the intents and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air. I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I pick up a reading now from verse 14. God said to Noah, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. And you will make windows in the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set the door in the ark in the side. You shall make it lower, second, and third decks. 
Behold, I myself will bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy it from under the heavens all flesh, in which is the breath of life, and everything that is on the earth shall die. And I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wives, and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. And they shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of creeping things of the earth after their kind, two of every kind. And I will come to you to keep them alive, and you shall take for yourselves all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it for yourselves, and it shall be food for you and food for them. And Noah did according to all that God commanded him. I was digging through the Guinness Book of Records uh, this week. I was looking up for certain things. And one of the things I looked for was for the, the largest flood. The largest flood. And I was very disappointed to see that they had them in Bangladesh and many parts of the world, but not one mention was mentioned, word of mentioned of the flood of Noah, which was the world's largest flood that has ever been. I went on to there to look for lengths of things. And I found out that the River Nile is the longest river. It's 4,160 miles. And then the Great Wall of China, the only man-made object that can be seen from space is 2,150 miles. I thought, that's interesting. So how far away is Mars? Just recently, we've been focusing on Mars and there's a little Land Rover thing called Endurance trundling about on the surface of Mars, digging into it, taking photos and sending them back. Well, I, I found out that Mars is 34 million miles away. And a, a satellite rocket, call it what you will, uh, has been traveling to Mars and it took six months traveling at 30,000 miles an hour to get to Mars. And my little mind, because I've got a funny sort of mind, so fancy being locked down in that thing for six months just to go on holiday. So I began to think of what it means to be locked down. So I went on from there and I looked at sieges. Because in the Bible we have several sieges where nations have come, surrendered a city and sieged the people in and basically they've been under lockdown. Before John, uh, Joshua uh, went round the walls of Jericho, we read that Jericho was straightly shut up. No one came in, nobody went out. So like us, Jericho was under lockdown. We don't know how long for, but obviously the walls came down and that was the end of the siege. But we also notice through reading scripture that once again, even Jerusalem had been besieged several times in the days of Hezekiah, but mostly in the days of Jeremiah. And this siege was with the Babylonians as they seized this city and terrible things were happening. You know, there was no food. They were scrabbling around, even eating the droppings from doves and pigeons to, to try and stay alive. And if they found a dead mule, his head was worth a lot of money just because you could get a little bit of meat off it. They were even eating their own children. Terrible things happened under lockdown. But we know that uh, going through this thing, that uh, it was very difficult for people to be under this lockdown. There was this fear they lived with of the Babylonians. And of course, eventually the walls were broken down and in came the invading Babylonians. And they captured everybody, took everything from the temple and the lockdown was over. But what a display it was. They were taken off to Babylon put into an even bigger, different kind of lockdown. But I move on through history, and it's not recorded in scripture, because in AD 70, Jerusalem was once again got on to be under siege, and people were under lockdown. This time it was the Romans. And our Lord had warned the Jews of his day in Matthew's Gospel that when you see these things happening, don't go back to your house and get your friends, tell your friends, just flee for your lives. And he reminded them to go to the mountains. And many believers in what our Lord had said, his lives were saved. A lot of the Jews ran out of the city of Jerusalem and they went to a place called Masada. And that is a large hill, mountain type of an area, very, very high in the desert. And it's very big. The unique thing about this Masada was that it had water supplies at the top. There was fountains up there or lakes up there which people could live on. 
And these people sieged themselves. They locked themselves down on the top of this big hill for two and a half years. And they defied the might of the Roman armies. The Roman armies were camped around the bottom, but they had enough food up there. They had enough water to survive this long, long siege. And it seemed as though the lockdown would have no end. No idea what was going to happen when the lockdown was over. But the Roman general was a canny guy. And he decided that his troops couldn't climb up and fight and attack and win this unassailable defence. So he started building a road. And he got his soldiers busy. And they built a road from the desert right up to the top of that hill. And eventually, after two and a half years, they were able to march right into the city. And when they got there, what did they find? They found that all the people in that city had taken their own lives. And all was left was dead bodies. The lockdown was over, but what a disastrous end. But I want to think with you this morning about this lockdown. Noah ends up in a lockdown. He's locked down in the ark. And it's the longest lockdown I know. In fact, he, he was 371 days in all. And we've been on lockdown for about 350 days so far. We're just getting near to that stage of a year and lockdown. God reigned for 40 days and 40 nights. There was 150 days before even they could see the daylight outside and eventually the ground earth was cleared. But why did God do this? Why did this lockdown, was this lockdown sent? Well, there's four reasons given in Genesis chapter 6, which remind us, and first of all, in verse 3, we have the cause of the lockdown. And God says, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he indeed is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Remember, up to this time, people were living eight, nine hundred years, up to a thousand. The protective ozone layer was giving us a wrong levity in many ways, and God was going to reduce this, and 120 years was going to be the limit. And Moses was a man who lived 120 years. But since Moses' days, of course, it's been down to what they call three score and ten or seventy years. And then afterwards, a struggle, says Moses in Psalm 90. But uh, the cause, the reason for the flood was the way that man's heart was evil continually. If you notice there in verse five, he said that he noticed that the intent and thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. And God was sorry that he made man on the earth. And God was going to take action about this. So that was the cause, the reason why they had the flood. And we don't always know the cause of things that happen. But in verse 8, we have the clause. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God is a God of mercy, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance and turn to him. And in that day, there was very few people. But God finds this man who who has grace in his heart and love in his thing. And the, eyes, the Lord recognises this. So there is the cause and the clause. And then there's the command in verse 13, go make yourself an ark. And all the details we've read this morning. And he makes this ark. And he saves the people. And then he's followed, of course, by the covenant there in verse 18. I will establish my covenant with you and you should go into the ark. You, your sons, your wives and your sons' wives with you and every living thing. This was it. And of course, finally, there's the covenant of the rainbow. But what was God Noah doing throughout 371 days? I've often asked myself the question, what would you have done over that time of 371 days? Well, he was obviously feeding the animals. But there must have been times when Noah feels a little bit like you and me sometimes as he walks around the deck of the ark. Mind you, it was a nice long walk. It was a big boat. Uh, that to be able to sort of just, what's going to happen after all this? But Noah's faith believed in a God that was going to take them through these situations, not abandon them in them. And God had promised that he was going to keep them alive. And you know, it's an amazing thought, isn't it? But what was God doing during the lockdown? I want to turn now to 1 Peter chapter 3 and to consider verses 18 to 22. Because we notice there in verse 20, 1 Peter 3, verse 18 to 22. We notice in verse 20 that God waited in the days of Noah. God is a past master at 
timing. And he waited. He had to wait 120 years for Noah to get the thing built. And then, of course, God waited as Noah was in the ark, as he watched over him. But how do we make sense of this story? What does it mean to us? Well, the interesting thing is that it has so much to teach us about God. Klaus Schwab is a German, and he's a chairman on the founder and the executive of a, a, a movement called the World Economic Forum, or WEF. You will hear it referred to many times. The environmentalists are very hot on this one, and so are the economists. And uh, he wrote a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset. The Great Reset. And he says these words, pandemic is a narrow window of opportunity to reflect, to reimagine, and to reset our world. And you can read the details at the back of the ET for this month. And I found it very challenging. You see, the interesting thing about the flood, it rescued people, right? And the most amazing message, our Lord uses it, that they were shut in. And Peter says here that on the days of Noah, God waited for the ark. And while the ark was being prepared, in which as few as eight souls were saved. But the door of salvation was open for them. They didn't go in. Now, it rescued people, but it never redeemed them. Put it to you like this. Those people came out of the ark the same way as they went in one way. They obviously worshipped God. We got that with Noah. But then we find Noah gets drunk. And it's only into chapter 11 of Genesis that you find that man, once again, is on the same agenda he's always been on. And that agenda is to rebuild the, his world as he sees it. God had given them instructions how they were to do it, but they didn't want God's instructions. And they began to build the tower, the Tower of Babel. And we know the story so well, the confusion, the chaos. And we're seeing this man, Klaus Schwab, move and motivating the world. David Attenborough's on board and Greta Thunberg, Prince Charles on board. Many of the economists are on board. And they're looking desperate around and saying, we have to do something to rebuild our world, to re-kickstart it, to get it going. My dry cleaning machine's a bit like that, it's governed by computers. And you go out there and you find that the fault button is flashing. And you walk up to it. And you try and work out what's gone wrong. And you see this magic little button called reset and you push it. And everything goes back to normal and the cleaner's on its way again. And you know, we think we have this kind of idea that we can reset our world and get it going again. It's going back to the thinking of Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. But it's not going to work like that. But that was the downside of the ark. They came out the same as they went in. But how did the children of Israel come out of Egypt? God instituted a thing called the Passover. And the Passover was the sacrifice of a lamb. They weren't just rescued from Egypt, they were redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of a lamb. And that beautiful picture comes right the way down through history to the New Testament. And Peter refers to it, we want to just drop on these verses this morning, verses 18 to 22. And we'll all ask ourselves a question to start with, what is purpose? Four things, God's purpose. And the covenant which God made with Noah, uh, are made with Abraham and all these people has now been brought into the New Testament covenant, the covenant of redemption. And you know, our Lord is about to, uh, Peter is about to explain how this works in the modern day thinking. And we notice there in chapter 2, 3 of Peter, uh, verse uh, 3 to 9, God is not willing that any should suffer. So it's 2 Peter 3, verse 9, God willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And God has made a way for us, because in verse 18 of the chapter we have before us this morning, we read that Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, being made alive by the Spirit. My friends, this morning, this is God's purpose for our world. As Hebrews chapter 2 says, that, that he wanted to bring many sons to glory. And the writer to the Hebrews, unknown to, 
to us. Also says these, these lovely words to us that, that God's plan, God's purpose for us is actually to save us. And he says these away, these amazing words. That God is faithful and he sent his son into this world. He appointed Moses as faithful in his all his head. And he wants to bring many sons to glory. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? But as we look at this verse this morning, we're reminding us that Paul Peter is reiterating for us the way that Christ had to suffer for our sins, to give his life, the just for the unjust, that sums up our world, that sums up the grace of God, that he might bring us to God. He had to be put to death. In the, physically, he died. He was, he was put to death. And God's wrath was poured out upon him instead of us. But he was made alive by the Spirit. Oh, the power of the resurrection and the hope that it gives. So my first thought from this chapter is God's purpose. God came to save. God came that we might have life and have life more abundantly. He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the Spirit. He was resurrected, that new body. And that is our hope for us as believers. This is the working out of the New Testament covenant of Christ giving his life a ransom for many. The New Testament, the new covenant in his blood. Secondly, in, in verse 19, we've got not only God's purpose, but we have God's preaching. Verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. One commentator has record, reported as writing this, no one really understands this verse. And so I'm not going to pretend I understand everything about this. But what I do know is it's by the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. Women, children, young people come to faith in Christ by the foolishness of preaching. And we are all imprisoned to Satan. We are under lockdown by Satan. Satan seems to be in control. But at the end of the day, he breaks those bars asunder and he bursts in with his joy of life and love into our lives. Just think of the story recorded in Luke chapter 8. And in Luke chapter 8 we have the madman of Gadara. And our Lord purposely goes across the lake and he faces this demonic man filled with all these demons. And he casts out the demons. And there is Legion sat at the Lord's feet clothed in his right mind and listening to the words of wisdom and love and peace. And he is reminded to go back and to tell all those what God has done for him. You see, his chains were gone. He could smash the human chains, but he couldn't smash the chains of sin. But these were shattered by our Lord himself and delivered. And this wonderful champion of the gospel was sent out. Yes, he went and he preached the spirits in prison. And my friends, many of the guys that I meet in on the inside are people in prison. But it's not just the bars. It's not the locked door of the cell. It's the prison of sin. The prison of their drugs, their addictions, their hate, their anger. And it's only the grace of God that can break those bands and give freedom. Yes, God's preaching. And in John chapter 8, we got those lovely words in verse 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. No longer locked in by sin, no longer locked in by it, but free. And that is what is so incredible. He sets us freed. Thirdly, this morning as we move into this chapter, we read of God's patience in verse 20. And this is where the story of Noah is reintroduced to us in the New Testament. Our Lord used it on several occasions. That was in the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marrying. So it shall be when the Son of Man comes again. But we notice here that who formerly were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while well, the ark was being prepared, in which is few, well that is, just eight souls were saved through water. We have God's patience. 20 years, 20, in verse 20, 120 years, Noah was constructing that ark. Did people join him in the job? I'm not sure. For most people, I noticed that they mocked him, laughed at him. They laughed in the days of Noah. And they said, we'll, we'll do our own thing. They just didn't want what God was offering to this wonderful salvation from the floods all around them. It wasn't until the day that Noah went into the ark, says our Lord. When this disaster came, they suddenly realized they left it too late. 
but the day of God's salvation. God's mercy stands open all day to the poor and the lonely and those who seek by the way. The ark saved physically, but no change spiritually. It was back to business as usual. What we're longing for now today, we hear the politicians saying this, won't it be great when we get back to normal? Businesses are sucking back into getting back to normal. Pubs are wanting to get back to normal. But does God want to get back to normal? Well, if nothing changes in our hearts, we will get back to normal. Well, that is not normal. What is normal? You were created in the image of God. And the way in which that makes it normal is that because you were created in the image of God, then you were created to worship God. That's normal. And Christ had to come into this sin ravaged world and it had to break those bonds, break those bands, break those chains and to give us that, that freedom, that liberty. And God is very patient and God waits. A thousand years is one day with the Lord, we know all that. But at the same time, God doesn't rush things. He doesn't get things out half done or forget things. He works out his purpose as year succeeds to year. And I don't know, but maybe there's seeds that I've sown in the prison that God has sown from Gideon Testament or Bible, given to a school child, 20, 30 years ago, that one day will bring fruit. And people we brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. For Jenny, as a nurse, as she qualified as a nurse, she was given a small little Gideon Testament. She went through her nursing life. She did very well. She became sister, moved up to a deputy in a hospital. And it was on that day when she was just packing things up to leave for the last time. She was retirement. She'd had a bunch of flowers from the staff. She'd had all sorts of cards and letters thanking for the many faithful years of 40 years of service in the NHS. And she was moving from her little flat where she'd lived for so long to a a little bungalow in the country and she was packing stuff up and she came across this small white testament at the back of a drawer and she sat on the end of the bed and she thought but oh, you know I've never looked at this and she began to read it and she began to realize that she'd shut God out of her life for 40 years as a nurse she had nursed the dying she had done so much as a nurse and she had gone up through the ranks and she'd done very well for herself Financially, she was well set up for the future. Then she began to read about the Lord Jesus Christ. And she began to read those parables. And she began to read how God was willing to give his son for her. And that day, her life was transformed. And as she moved out into retirement, she moved out a new person. My friends, God is very patient. He's patient with you, he's patient with me. And he, he, the long suffering of God. Do you know, some of us may be saying today, when is God going to do something about this? We look at the refugee situation across the world and we just hang out. Those girls have been released now that were captured only the other day, kidnapped from a school, and all this evil goes on. And we are quite tempted, like Malachi, like Haggai to say, Habakkuk to say, well, God, don't you see these things? What are you going to do about this? But God is still working out his purpose. And sometimes it's going to get worse before it gets better. But God is completely in control of everything. And he, he knew he, he was going to save those eight people. And God in his sovereignty, because he has hindsight, he knew, because he has forethought as well, that only eight were going to go into that ark. And from that, he was going to rebuild a new community. But it was a community that was going to depend on redemption, not rescue. Because you have to be redeemed by the love of the Lord of the Lamb. And Christ done this. God's patience. And we have this in Jet ba the Tower of Babel. We have it still today in our world. We are going to re-kickstart this world. We are going to get things going again. But God has different plans. And his plan is to redeem us, not just to rescue us from our problems. That's the picture God gives us in verse 21. This is God's picture now, my third point this morning. This also is an antitype or a picture of baptism. And I love this picture, which now saves us, namely baptism. It's not by the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My friend, baptism doesn't wash away your sins. Naaman, in the story in the two kings, was leprous. And he came to Elisha one day and Elisha told him to go and wash in the river Jordan and his flesh would become new like a little child. Well, he didn't want to do it. He got very angry. And he had to be persuaded by his counsellors that this was a good thing to do. It wasn't the washing that made him clean, although Elisha said wash and be clean. It was the faith of going through it. And when he gets there after seven times, he looks at his flesh. My friends, baptism doesn't wash away your guilt. You may can do horrendous things and you may go home and you can shower as much as you like. And you can try and make your body clean, but it doesn't get rid of the guilt on the inside. No. You see, baptism is the answer of a good conscience. To become a Christian, we all know very simply, you repent of your sins. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. That's so simple, isn't it? But it's so true. <clears throat> but the Bible, the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, they said, repent, believe, and be baptized. Baptism is not baptismal regeneration that makes you new. The baptism is the badge you wear. It's the, it's the picture. It says here, it's the picture. And it's the answer of that conscience before God. Because the Bible teaches that baptism <clears throat> or confession of your faith is, is a, it's a principle of the Christian life. It's not essential for going to heaven, but it does give you that lovely, clear conscience to know that you have done what God commanded you to do. Go into all the world, says Jesus, and preach the gospel and, be baptized, and let them be baptized. It was a practice that has happened in the early church. It's a wonderful picture. Yeah. And finally, this morning, it's God's power. So we have on reflection this morning, God's purpose in verse 18. We have God's preaching in 19, we have God's patience in verse 20, God's picture in 21, and finally God's power. And if we read this through again, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, <coughs> being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. The former were disobedient, but once the long suffering of God waited as in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is just eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, a picture, which is now saved as mainly baptism. Not that it removes the sinfulness of our lives, but the answer of the good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the fundamental thing for us. Not only that Christ died, but he rose again. And picking this up now for my final point then, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse 22, he's now gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels, authorities and powers are being made subject to him. Matthew 28, Jesus' last words to the disciples was, all authority is given me in heaven and on earth. You think of our Lord glorified now and the book of Revelation gives him so many pictures of this this resurrected Saviour. We, we see him as the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. We see him as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And in chapter 5 of Revelation, we read these lovely words. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honour, glory and blessing. And they sang this song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain. You've redeemed us unto God out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, and made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on the earth. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the sea, and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever. And they said, Amen. They agreed. They believed. And as our Lord is in glory now, so by his spirit he lives in the life of each one of his children. And God is working out his grand eternal purpose. And remember, we won't be saved from this pandemic by rescue. But we will be saved by redemption. Because 
you know, this world is passing away. Many people have died through the last 12 months. Families are grieving and sorrowing. And you know, there seems to be no end to these issues. But God come to give us a new life. A new heaven in which dwells righteousness. A heaven to which we, one day our Lord said, I go to prepare, prepare it for you that where I am, there you will be also. And what was it resurrected him from the grave? It was the power of God that brought him back to life again. And the power that resurrected Jesus will also resurrect you and me. Those who believe to everlasting peace and joy in heaven. What a glorious day that will be, brothers and sisters. And to those who don't believe, to that awesome judgment of saying like the people outside the ark, why on earth didn't I do it before? And they're desperate. But God gives us the channel of the gospel message for us to go and preach to those in prison and to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so we pray your blessing upon you this time in Jesus' name. Amen.